that may actually be the best suggestion regarding our industry that I have heard. Um, I absolutely agree, and I would say all right in those companies, right? Because Nintendo, Sony, uh, these are companies that have pulled their vocal support, but haven't pulled their financial support. And as we know, your, your verbal support means nothing. Your financial support is what means everything in this case. And so yeah, I agree. We should start We should start writing companies to say, if you don't support stuff, approve it. Abandon the ESA, don't, don't be at this E3. Um, because I mean, the E3, E3's been crumbling, it's on the last legs for years. This is, this is a time where you can really make a difference. The internet, you said the internet's a good place to be very loud. Mm -hmm. Stuart's actually going to be in charge and be making it very loud, very quickly. Well, make sure you definitely. <laughs> We know it, it is 7 o'clock, but nothing else is happening in this room for the rest of the evening, as far as I know. I am fine with continuing to go if you guys want it for anybody who wants to keep it. You guys have. So, anybody who wants to stick around, anybody who wants to leave because they're like great concerts and stuff, let feel free. But, like, anybody who doesn't want to stick around will stick around too. So, yes. Next question. Actually, like game jam because they're known that it's basically you get to put other people on their to together and just make games for other people for that big stuff. And uh, just going down to the land for those games and more stuff by the deal. And the question was um, more on the game, uh, more on the game character with the way of putting games up right on chaotic multiplayer. Because just some games, that are, uh, I don't know if you guys know the idea of board for the Monaco, it, um, it, it was a well, it's a cold price game and it's one of the most chaotic, ridiculous, and sometimes hard to understand games I've played, but one of the most fun. And I just, I, I wonder what you guys think on um, multiplayer games, not necessarily being clear, but just being chaotic and affecting your own kids online. I think, um, how do I feel about multiplayer games being strictly chaotic? I mean, if it's engaging, who cares how it's engaging, right? I, I think I, I think I'm all for a game that's still good, but chaotic, right? Uh, so yeah, I I don't think that we have to have any formula for what makes a game good or fun. Yeah. Photo real stuff is going to look pretty much photo real all the time. 
and that's just how things look. And that's and stuff like that can look amazing. Like Uncharted can look very good, but I, most of my favorite gaming experiences are usually something that is quite stylized and gorgeous in its own way. Like like Psychonauts has a great stylized look about it. Uh, Okami is still gorgeous, even though it's on an old PS2, uh, PS2 SD. And it's on the Wii as well, I'm not sorry. And, like, Wind Waker is still gorgeous. And, like, I just love seeing a great stylized look about it or something. So, as, on the one hand, I'm, I'm totally supporting it, like, games that push photorealism and kind of push the boundaries even further for what we can actually do. Like, I'm really impressed with, even though the stuff they did with L.A. Noir, for example, it's not, I mean, it's certainly not perfect. You can see all kinds of problems with it. It's uh, the, uh, the body and the head animation recorded separately, so, which as an animator you know that's going to mean it's not going to quite match, like when they're looking at things, it's not going to quite feel right. It's just, it's not perfect, but that was their first try. Like, this is the first time they ever did anything like that, and it still looks pretty amazing. Like, imagine if they kept it going, like, if they, well, if they were bankrupt now, but imagine if they, <laughs> imagine if somebody else took that technology and kept going with it, kept pushing it, like, think of how many, like, think of what that could do for, like, franchise-type games, like, like, say, Harry Potter games suddenly wouldn't have this creepy-ass Harry Potter and Ron running around that don't look anything like, that just really uncanny and weird, you'd, ac you'd actually have, like, if you could, if they would actually pay him, like Daniel Radcliffe or somebody actually like doing a performance for all of this stuff in the game, and it'd actually be him and look like him. That that seems like a kind of cool thing. It actually might make me want to play a game like that. But uh, yeah, that's what, that's me though. That's kind of creepy. Um, all right. So uh, as far as stylization goes, I think we've got a lot to explore in the aesthetics of games. I think there's more to the aesthetics of games than even the visuals. Right? There's this really old joke in the games industry that I hear almost every sound designer say, which is that if you have fantastic sound design, all the reviewers will say the graphics are great. Um, and it's kind of true, right? There, we are a holistic, multidisciplinary activity. Um, and so uh, I think there have been fantastic styles that have been delivered artistically, and a lot more thinking has to go into that area. But we also have to think about it as a whole and how even our game mechanics themselves fit into aesthetics. Are the same visual styles, the same audio styles appropriate for, are the same audio styles powerful for different mechanics, right? We have to start thinking about how these things actually interrelate to deliver an aesthetic, a true video game aesthetic, rather than a visual aesthetic or an audio aesthetic. So that's my two cents. Well, so this is sort of a side tangential thing, but as far as photorealistic stuff goes, I would love to see more attention paid to uh, um, I think animation is an area where a lot there's still a lot of room to go. Like the games you think about for like that for photorealism, like sort of like looks really good. Like we go to like Uncharted or like looking back like Metal Gear Solid 4. There have been plenty of other games that have had higher like graphical fidelity even than some of those. But the characters in those so like Nathan Drake isn't it's not like an amazing model and texture and everything, but he's animated really well. There's a ton of personality that he's got to him. And that, and like that, Solid Snake has a Metal Gear Solid 4, and like good animation goes a long way towards. Well, it is, it is literally bringing a character to life. So, and I think that that's that's maybe just me as an animator, but that's something I'd like seeing way more attention and money being spent <laughs> being spent toward in the future. So that's me. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm not entirely sure what your kind of sound recording setup is. Amateur. But um, <laughs> when you guys finished recording the Paula Juarez episode, did you have a mic to drop? And did you? Because that was funny. <laughs> and, and what kind of feedback had, had you gotten back from, from taking my episodes? I, I have people that I know don't regularly watch any sort of kind of video game commentary that have sent me that as kind of the first thing they've seen in that regard. Uh, but I, just, I did not drop my mic because it's as cheap as it is, it's the only one I've got. But, uh, at one point you, James, you recommended to me, like, an ending for some episode. It might have been that one, just a serious one where we literally had the character drop the mic, which I don't know how it happens because it's attached to the desk, but, like, literally drop the mic and, like, the lights go out, which I vetoed, ended up, ended up vetoing. But, I, 
the Cold War is episode that is the most exhausted I've been at the end of recording an episode. And I probably, like, looking back on it, I probably did, like, finish recording it and was feeling really raspy and exhausted and just, like, just sat back and was shit. <laughs> just, like, I was probably, like, I think, kind of a little angry the rest of the day. And, like, that is definitely the most, like, shouty sort of semi sort of that I've gotten for any sort of episode. So, and, uh, and these guys have been called Warriors before, so they, yeah, it's, well, when we had literally got the game to do for Unskippable, like a couple days before your episode aired, and so we saw yours, and we were like, oh, we are in for a treat with this game. <laughs> and I think that we did, do we do two episodes up or just the one? We did two. Yeah, we did do two. And, this, and the whole, the whole opening cutscene sounds like they recorded it in a tin can. <laughs> it's super weird. They're all sitting around in an office, and, and, and it sounds like tinny and terrible, and they have the same, like, neck-body problem. <laughs> And the snowstorm that happens to be going on in that office at the same time. And, oh my god. But if you have to check out the Unskippable on Call for Head. Yeah, if, no, don't buy the game. Check out their Unskippable. Yeah, don't, don't, don't buy it. No. <laughs> but check out Unskippable and see the, and enjoy the pain that way. Thank you. How y'all doing? I'm a big fan. I hope we get your autographs later. Yes. We'll be here. We've got a better deal. <laughs> okay, uh, great. I am, I'm a new developer. I've, uh, <laughs> I'm a new developer. It's like I've been paid twice. <laughs> So, finally got a game out, it's downloadable on the, on the DSi 3DS. We finally got, I finally got a game out on a console, and it feels really great, but we didn't make any money. I'm not sure what to do next, and I really don't know where to go. So, the tragedy of DSi is DSiWare. What's the name? Love it! Love it! Yeah, it's called Antipole. It's a um, oh. gravity inverting platformer that isn't me. We actually have like graphics and sprites in our game, and you can invert gravity. So, I'll okay. go fly over here. Cool. <laughs> 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 so, the problem with the vast majority of um, smaller games that are released today is that uh, both of the iPhone platforms like is I wear the Xbox in the uh, they don't make a big page. It's it's very difficult. Um, but now you're in a much better position to pitch your next game to any new platforms, right? So since you clearly proved that you can execute, you have a game which has gone live, got some sales, <coughs> uh, were it me, if you didn't hit the target numbers you wanted it, it depends. If you've got a lot of resources to fall back on, then you now take a run at see if you can get on the cartridge on the DS, right? If you don't have a lot of resources to get fall back on, you talk to Nintendo and other publishers about seeing if, hey look, we built this thing, it's out there, it really works, people seem to really like it, but clearly we didn't have the marketing distribution we needed to um, uh, do a broad launch. So uh, we're looking to do our next project. Uh, can we just have a meeting for public space? Um, and then finally, if you've got uh, some resources to fall back on, as it can easily afford it, I mean, DSI was a weird deal. Like, it's kind of hard to put it to a scene, that sort of thing. But, but if you need to already have it, well, then, I mean, contact off, right? Steam is a great place for games of that nature. And honestly, uh, given how much easier reporting things has sort of become, uh, you should be selling it on every platform you can conceivably sell it on and driving traffic back to some centralized location so that way uh, you can uh, really aggregate your community, right? Uh, and once you've done that and you've got it on every platform you can possibly uh, get it out to, it's on iPhone, it's on Steam, it's on DSiWare, all the things are not going to cost you anything to put it on. 